Thank you. <laughs> We're going to do this sort of like that James Lipton actor's uh, studio thing. Right. Yeah. He was very sweet. That was the only way I would agree to it. So thank you. <laughs> I told you you'd have to get in front of a podium and make this big speech. We just have a casual conversation. And I'd ask you a few questions, and then we let some of the students and some of the other uh, people here ask you some. But just to kind of give a little background, um, Rachel grew up in Northern California, which is a different country than where I grew up in Southern California. Uh, uh, and, uh, but you, you went to New York, and you became an intern at Rockaware. And yes, next I, thing you know, in a flash, you were like the creative director for a whole company. For, for not a flash for me, no. <laughs> But um, I can see how it, how it might appear that way. Um, I grew up in Northern California, and I was raised by hippies, which at the time was completely different from my aesthetic. And I think that that's how I learned the art of balance. And it's something that I'm still striving towards, but I apply it to business. And I find that where I can think out of the left side and the right side of my mind, where I can balance 50-50 is where I have the most success, and I know that some speakers have talked about the left side and the right side, and it's something that I'm challenged with. But that initially started from childhood. I went to school on the East Coast, and then I moved to New York to get into fashion. Right. Uh, so did your parents like have a Volkswagen bus, you know, one of those? They have a Chinook. I don't, I don't know if you know what that is. And any of you that do, I, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's... it's one of my gifts, um, I think one of my greatest gifts actually was my childhood because we didn't have much. And what motivates me in business is the knowledge that if anything happens with my company, God forbid, I will be okay. And that's from my childhood not, not having much. Um, having the confidence to understand that not having much has nothing to do with personal happiness, um, at least on a monetary level. And growing up with not much actually gave me a lot of confidence because you don't have any material goods to show your worth through. You simply have you. And it's nothing that a child wants. God forbid I had the, um, I had kids without the little blue label on the back. And I was called out for it many times in school, but um, I had a choice. And so at the time my choice was to make my, um, my friends think that that's how it was supposed to be. <laughs> so they asked me if they were kids, and I said, no, no, this is how they're supposed to be. So now as I design as an adult, I actually don't like putting labels on things because I think it holds us back and it hinders us. Very good. That's actually a great you know, life lesson you know, about yeah. growing up with little yeah. or nothing and then um, recognizing that when you have something that you can actually live without it is, is uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a different place than I think a lot of people who start with a lot, you know, and end up uh, not having quite so much. Uh, it would be a very different experience. Yeah, I, I challenge myself every day to figure out how I can give my children the thirst and the hunger that I had because I think that's the one thing that will make them successful in business. And while I don't want them to experience what I had to experience, I know 100% that if they don't, they probably won't have the drive to work as hard as you need to work to become successful. So I need to uh, edit myself in what I give them. I need to edit myself in how much I allow them to experience through my um, personal gain. And I need to show them what the world is really like. Well, I'm sure you will. I have two examples of those in the front. Uh, yes, front you do. Row. I'm very impressed with both of them. <laughs> um, so you, you, I'm told you know, that you were like uh, dressing your brother when you, he was a little kid and you were a little kid. So like, you, you like <laughs> dove into this as a career when you were like five or six or something? I did, yeah. Um, one thing I'm not is, um, you know, I actually don't like public speaking. But I do have a very strong opinion when it comes to fashion. It's one thing I have a strong opinion about. And he was my subject. <laughs> poor, poor guy. And um, he allowed me to experiment on him. And to this day, that's why my father, my father blames me for him being gay. Which I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a terrible, terrible joke, but if he was here, he would laugh. And it's true. And, um, you know, 
to me that that's why my gay husbands and my gay boyfriends uh, inspire me greatly. <laughs> Okay, so you, and, and uh, uh, Wes alluded to this, you have had the, the pleasure and the privilege of dressing the First Lady uh, Michelle Obama, you've dressed uh, Ava Mendez, I know, you've dressed Kate Hudson, and the list goes on and on and on, so t just talk a little bit about that experience, and is it good for you, good for the business? You know, I think my biggest honor was dressing Michelle Obama. I didn't know it was going to happen. Uh, I, in my designer collection, design for the woman that I aspired to be. So it's a very personal collection for me. And the woman I aspire to be has very similar traits to Michelle. And one of the great blessings, if you work on something that you love, is knowing that you have made someone else feel better about themselves. And when you feel good about yourself, you can go out into the world and do what you need to accomplish. And when I discovered that she was wearing my clothes, it, I was over the moon, um, literally over the moon. And the other big plus would be dressing Oprah because she also has a very strong point of view. She won't wear a lot. And when she started wearing my clothing, again, it made me feel like I'm doing something right. I can trust myself. I can trust my gut. And she also has a pretty big audience. She has a very big <laughs> audience, yes. <laughs> Which is good for me, because she sells clothes. Um, yeah. <laughs> so keep dressing Dress Oprah. <laughs> dressing celebrities is a huge, huge um, coup. However, in my opinion, and I don't want to offend anyone, celebrities don't have a lot of taste. In my, in my opinion, they don't have great style. There's a few that do, um, Diane Kruger, and, um, you know, there's a few that I, that I'm sure I do there's think. another one. <laughs> there's more. But um, they're all dressed by stylist. So for me, uh, when real women wear my clothes, to be honest, that's the biggest honor. Uh, when we first, we first met, and I'll never forget it, it was just the three of us. It was Wes and, and Rachel came to see me, and we were in our boardroom at, at Macy's. And um, the two of them came and said, listen, we... We had this idea, and, and Rachel started off the conversation, and I knew her designer line, and it was magnificent and beautiful and, and just incredible details and extraordinarily expensive. And uh, I said, this is really great, really interesting. Um, I can't sell, I have no customers for this product. <laughs> you know? And, and it, because it was, it was magnificent, but it was like five, $800 blouses, you know, beautiful, beautiful product. And so um, Rachel said, I want to design a line that my friends can afford to wear. And, um, and you know, it, with you, maybe somebody else, but I just want to talk about that. And so I became very, by the way, she was at least nine months pregnant when we had this meeting because I was extremely nervous. I was like, you know, what am I going to, she's going to have a little baby right here, right here <laughs> in my border. I mean, I mean, I was so nervous about this. I kept, and you, and you were like, oh, yeah, it's fine, no problem. Let me just talk about this. And I'm like, are you sure do you want to postpone this meeting for like a couple of months? And no, 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 it's fine. And uh, so, but, but that's, but we had that great meeting, and, uh, you know, we, we just said, God, it'd be great if you could do something. But I did tell Wes, I said, you know, I would like to actually see some product, you know, that, that isn't, $500 blouses, and, and so if I can actually see the interpretation of the product. And he came back, to, called me the next day, and he said, um, I'm going to bet that we're going to satisfy you, and I'm just going, I, I love Rachel, and I love what she's doing, I believe in the vision, we're going to buy into this company, and we, we are going to, Rachel and I are going to convince Macy's and you that you're going to buy this product, and it's going to be exclusive. And so you just did that all on a basically on a bed, on, on, a, on a meeting, and it was really amazing that you did that. And obviously you were right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I don't really know what to say to that other than um, one area that I have confidence in is fashion. And I know what I don't know, and sometimes that's just as important as knowing what you're good at is knowing what you're not good at. And I know that I need to surround myself personally with people that are much smarter than me so that I can grow my brand. But I do have a confidence in the type of fashion that I like. It's not for everybody. And the great thing about fashion is that there is something out there for everyone, so you don't have to please everyone. And my goal is not to please everybody. Um, but I do want to provide classic fashion with a twist for women that like it and for young girls that like it. And my confidence lies in the fact with my Macy's brand that I was that girl 
in Monterey, California, where I grew up, Macy's was the creme de la creme. It was the fanciest store. It was actually a store that I couldn't afford. And to go back into design for Macy's, I completely understand the customer. And I understand that she wants what she sees in Vogue, that she can afford a Vogue magazine. It's three bucks, but she can't afford what's in stores um, that for the most part, Vogue, Vogue shows in their magazine. And that's the, that's the type of product that I try to give. And I believe in it, I wear it, and um, I, I stand up for it. And uh, thank you for believing in, in and, me. And it's been, it's all, obviously it's all, all, all worked out because it's been the most successful you know, launch of contemporary apparel that we've had in, in the company. And it's just been ro a roaring success. Um, so you, 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 you do embody this modern woman, you know, entrepreneur, designer, mother, uh, you've, you've got philanthropists, you give back, you do all of these, all of these things. How do, you, how, do you, you know, how, do you, how do you do that and how do, you, how do you keep the balance in doing all of those things? It's a constant struggle to keep the balance, to be honest with you. Um, I do find that to be successful in business, you have to be the first to arrive and you have to be the last to leave. And those are the type of employees that I hire to work for me. Um, if I'm interviewing people and they even ask me, you know, what are the hours, I won't even consider them, no matter how talented their books are. With that said, I have two young girls and I need to balance time for them. And so I think, if anything, it just makes me relatable to my customers and to uh, real women out there and, and real people out there that I struggle. But uh, fortunately, I picked a career that I absolutely love and that I have a passion for. And I don't mind the long hours. And if anything, I hope that it shows my girls that they have to work very hard to uh, take care of themselves as well. You, you've, uh, in West, talk about this in the video, uh, you've done collaborations with, um, with other uh, celebrities, and uh, Estelle uh, was one recently, came to Macy's and did a jewelry collection. Talk about that a little bit. So I'm quite inspired by art, um, live music, even if it's not a, a genre that I particularly love. If it's live, I absolutely adore it. And just hearing uh, the two girls singing on the videos was very inspiring to me. So um, I need to surround myself with art at all times. And I chose Estelle to work with because I had been following her in WWD. And she was taking a lot of risks fashion-wise. She was wearing a lot of pieces that many Americans would probably not understand. And that Us Magazine and Touch Magazine, those types of publications, would probably end up putting on their worst dress list. And to me, that was quite inspiring. And I wanted to showcase and honor someone that was doing that because I like for our young people to be individuals and to not have to wear the labels that everyone else is wearing. And that was my first, um, my first ask. That she was the one that I really wanted to work with. And I met her and we clicked. And it does have to be organic. So I noticed that she liked large scale jewelry, which is something that I liked. But I need to keep myself inspired. So A, it was for me, and then B, it was for my uh, customer base as well. And it worked, obviously. Um, and you, uh, you have um, uh, relationships with these philanthropic groups. I know Fairwinds is one of them, which we share. Um, and uh, we have a passion for. And you, I know, have, have picked up on your version of that. Talk about that a little bit. When I was looking for funding, um, and we were getting close to signing with Jones, and I uh, did some research on Jones and figured out very quickly that their biggest uh, partner was Macy's. It was very important to me to work with a charity. And so I did just a little bit of research on Macy's and found out that they worked with Fairwinds. And so when I was um, in talks with Jones, I said, you know, I want to work into my contract that at least once a season you will produce a piece for me through Fairwinds. And the reason I chose Fairwinds, I had already been working with a, a charity, actually an orphanage in Ghana. And I didn't push my personal, um, my personal charity that I was working with. I wanted Jones to say yes quickly. And the first time I asked, they said yes. And so to me, that was another reason that I, I needed to go with Joan, someone that was so willing to do something that clearly wouldn't make them any money at all, um, but they were willing to not only make me happy, they were willing to, to do something that was so good for the, the greater cause and the greater good. Um, 
And when I talk to young people, I tell them that all they have to do is ask because you never know. So my kids that work in um, movie theaters, for example, ask once a week, once a month, if your company will allow a group of kids to come in and watch a movie for free. You never know what you get if you ask. And it's, it's one of the most fulfilling things that I do is working with Fairwinds. And I think when we offer solutions for people, they're, they're more willing to get onto our cause. And he had a program where you give up an event. So for me, I gave up my birthday and I asked for people that would normally give me presents to donate to this charity. And we built enough, um, I think, for about two wells in Africa. And it not, not only benefits me, because I think, you know, while I'm so busy, I'm not giving back enough, but of course it benefits um, the, the kids in Africa, but it also benefits my children because they can see how easy it is to help. And it benefits anyone that's following me, either on Twitter or Facebook, to see how simple it is um, as well. And let's talk about that, because you are on Twitter and you are on Facebook. You are all over social media. Yeah, I must admit, in the beginning, I was quite against it. I'm not someone that knows um, anything about the internet. I still don't know what an app is. And I need to credit Stacy, uh, who runs marketing at Jones, to kind of show me what it was and say, listen, you don't have to put up anything that's too personal. It's just a way to talk to people that actually care about your opinion. And I was very leery at first. And when I saw the support and when I saw that people really had genuine questions on how to get into fashion and what do I think goes with this dress or, um, you know, why did you put Kerry Washington in this dress and not that dress? Just simple little things. People, people want to know and it actually became quite fun for me. I look forward to it. And uh, when I do my personal appearances at Macy's, I most enjoy talking to the young kids because they're so honest and they're so raw and they just really want to know. And that's what I find on Twitter. Um, and I can talk to them so quickly. Um, speaking of young people, um, I, want to, I want to ask if any of the students have any, uh, any, any questions for Rachel. I'll come back and I've got some more, but in the meantime I'll ask, is there a question uh, that someone might have for, for Rachel? Back over here. Okay, my question would be, um, since you are a stylist, um, what's like the thinking process you have behind putting each outfit together for a specific celebrity or um, event? I think my goal when dressing anyone, including myself, is to look unique and to have a voice and to have um, an individual message. And I don't like the idea of anyone looking um, like anybody else. I like people to be comfortable, and my um, aesthetic would be relaxed glamour. I think the most important thing for someone is to feel comfortable and to be confident. And then I'll ask a question, then I'll open it back up again. Um, so where, where, do you see, where do you see yourself, Rachel, in, let's say, a year from now, and let's say 10 years from now? Um, I would like to grow the brand to a point that I have a really good staff under me, which I already do. I have a really great uh, team of girls that, that believe in the product and are working very, very hard. Um, but I would like to get to the point where I do have more time to spend with my children because that is a huge guilt on my part. <laughs> I'm sure it's a guilt <laughs> of anybody as busy as you are who has children. Uh, who else? Another uh, question from the, from the audience. Yes, over here. Okay, I actually just tweeted about you, so just so you know. <laughs> I hope it was good. It was very good, but I was just curious. Um, ready to wear fashion is becoming really popular with like Tori Burch and Ellie Tahari in the fashion weeks. So I was just kind of curious how you as a contemporary designer are differenti differentiating yourself um, in your ready to wear line and maybe your shows that you do. Um, to me, I am definitely a follower of fashion, and ready to wear to me is um, American sportswear fashion. So I think American designers design uh, for commerce, and it's not a bad thing, it's just simply what, what it is. And I think in Europe, there is a bit more freedom to design um, just simply to move fashion forward. And um, you know, there's going to be a lot of opinions on that, 
But I do think that fashion shows should be to move fashion forward, similar how, to how you go to a museum and you're inspired. I think that the Zaras of the world and the, the H&Ms of the world come in and they watch those shows and then they, they take their vision and they put it um, in their stores for affordable fashion. And some people hate that and then other, people's lo other people love that. I personally don't think there's anything wrong with it because I like the idea of fashion being accessible and um, for fashion to not be exclusive. So when I talk about ready to wear, I think of it as um, American designer fashion that is still quite expensive. And what I'm doing for Macy's is trying to take my aesthetic and uh, make that for the younger sister to my ready to wear line. Uh, next question is, is for me is, um, I was with you at uh, a couple number of events you've done in our stores, but one in particular, you know, we, we literally had to have security sort of manage <laughs> the situation because there's so many young women that were mobbing, you know, you, you coming around and just, just wanted to talk to you and ask you questions and they were just lined up all over the, all over the store just to uh, try to get at you, just to, just to kind of talk to you. What, what are they asking you? What are they, what, what's on their mind and, you know, what, what, are they, what do they want to know from Rachel Roy? I think most, most girls that come to those events are simply into fashion and they're excited by fashion. And to me, it means a great deal to speak to them. So I, I, I stay and I talk to every single one of them and if they have questions, I answer them. And mostly they either want to be a designer or they want to be a model. And both, the, it's particularly being a model uh, scares me. And so I try to show them and um, talk them out of actually being a model. And I, I explain to them how they could start their own agency or they could model while they're doing something else or they could be a hand model or they could be this or that. But the modeling business is a quite difficult industry. And then when it comes to designing, I, whatever questions I have, I'll, I'll stay and explain to them, but I also let them know that they need to take some business classes if they truly want to be a designer so that they can run their business. Because just to have your head, head in the clouds and, and be able to create a beautiful fashion, unfortunately, does not mean that you'll be a designer. Very, very good advice. A uh, question over here. Is there a microphone? Hi, I'm not a student, but I teach high school students fashion design, and I'm wondering what your high school experience was, if you took any of those classes, do you sew, and also what was your post-secondary uh, education? Um, I went to a public high school, and I did take a sewing class. I was not any good at it at all. I actually gave a lot of the work to my mother to help me on. And both my mother and my father uh, knew how to sew and, and taught me that, but I more kind of creative directed my parents, and they helped me with that. And um, the, the thing about public high school was there was so many different types of people, and I had to deal with so many personalities, I think that just helped me um, later on in life, because half of running your own company is being a psychologist and dealing with personalities, and I wish more of it was actually design but to run a company, it's the gift and the curse. You have to take the good with the bad, and people need your attention, and they need your time, and you need to know how to manage people, which is why I suggest taking business classes if you really do want to be a designer. Um, from there, I went, from Northern California, I went to college on the East Coast. I went to a Christian school, which was a family school that most of my family attended. They did not offer fashion, so I took psychology and English, which were two subjects that, that I had a lot of interest in, and the psychology definitely helps me with, with what I'm doing now. Um, but I just had a love of it, and I have started fashion uh, on the retail side since I was 14, and I've worked in nothing other than fashion for um, a little over 17 years. What's the, uh, so what's the most challenging part of uh, being a designer, and uh, how, do you, how do you address those challenges? Um, at the point that I'm at now, the most challenging would just simply be time management. And I, I try to solve that with very quick decisions. And fortunately, um, a lot of my decisions are, ha have to do with fashion, and I can make quick, de quick decisions. Um, one of my strengths is editing, and you need to know how to edit yourself. 
um, to tell a strong story. Absolutely. Um, another question from the audience. Question back here. Back. Uh, two quick things for you. As a woman, what is your advice to women going into business and fashion? And what is your favorite book that you would recommend? Mm, good questions. Um, I have a ton of books by my bed, and most of them I don't get to. But I am reading an author. His name is David Sierdis. His sister is Amy Sierdis, and um, they're both comedians. And he is very self-deprecating, and it's literally a laugh-out-loud book. And I think that, um, again, the balance is what I'm always looking for. And so that is something that I escape into, is reading. Um, I also have a book called Clean, which is about cleansing. And um, Gwyneth Paltrow suggested it, if that helps anybody. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so those are the two books that I'm, I'm reading both at the same time. And to women in business, I would say, as a young girl, I wasn't allowed to watch TV, um, but I would sneak old movies, and so I became quite inspired by the 1940s um, heroine, so Tallulah Bankhead and Ava Gardner. And um, what I found inspiring by them was the idea that you could be both feminine and strong. And I don't think that you can't have one or the other, although sometimes society would dictate that if you um, are quite feminine, you can't be strong. And so I'm very motivated by designing feminine designs for strong women. And I would say be humble and be polite and be kind, but be strong and stick to your point of view. And as long as your intent is good, um, usually you can get what you want. <laughs> what's, uh, what's, the, what's been the biggest change um, since um, going from being just on your own to the Jones uh, New York family? Um, well, quite honestly, the biggest change would be getting your bills paid on time, <laughs> which is amazing. And uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have a company today. I'm, I'm quite sure if, if Jones did not come in and um, start backing me. I was at the point where every two weeks I did not know how I was going to pay my employees. And like Terry mentioned, I was nine months pregnant and you know, just going through other stresses in life. Um, and you don't want your employees to leave, so you don't want to mention to them that, that they may not be getting paid um, bi-weekly. Um, so yeah, I would, I would definitely not be in business without Jones, or at least not in my own business without Jones. I had interviewed uh, a number of companies, and Jones felt the most organic and the most, most real, and I got along with the staff the best. And in anything, I think your customers will see, your staff will see, if something is not organic, if it's not real, if it's not authentic. Um, it has to be spot on. And I had that relationship with the staff of Jones, thank God. Great. Question from the audience. Rachel. Um, here I am, uh, uh, Soyeon Shim, a professor at the U of A here, and thanks for coming out. And I appreciate your comment about you know how to raise children uh, uh, with hardship so that it's not that you know, that devastating, but also educational. And that's something that we cha we get challenged not only as mom here, but also as an educator. You know how do you how do you provide that so that, that our children and our students learn uh, from that while they are still learning, and so that they can you know uh, be successful as you are. Any recommendation? What do you do to, to provide the intentional hardship without devastating them? That's a great question. And I talk with moms that I'm friends with all the time about how do I provide enough pain for my child? <laughs> <laughs> because my first inclination is to spoil my kids. I love them. I don't see them enough. And I want them to love me as much as I love them. So it's not an easy thing to do at all. But because I had the childhood, again, that I had, um, I, I do give my childhood, um, I think, the credit that it deserves for making me the person that I am. I realize that if they don't have a little bit of thirst and a little bit of hunger, um, they won't succeed. And I, when I go on vacation, for example, I took my, um, my oldest daughter to Jamaica for her spring break, and I took her to rural Jamaica so she could see that most likely the people that are serving us in um, the resort that we're staying at go home and live in huts after they're done serving us our drinks. And 
while that may have been a joy kill for her, she needs to see what real life is really, really like. And I take her to Africa with me when I go. She's been to the orphanage in Ghana um, that I support. And um, we go to Harlem, and we, we, we live in New York, so we go to Harlem, and, and we do different programs there. Um, I'm taking her actually out of private school, and I'm putting her in public school, and that's something that I just decided this year because I don't think that she has enough experience with all types of children. Um, so daily, I, I push her. She, she has to take care of herself. She's 10, and... Um, I probably treat her like she's a little bit older than she actually is, so, so that she can be challenged in that way. Um, you know, it, it's something that I, I do struggle with. Sounds like you've got it under control. <laughs> uh, what do you, so what do you do uh, to relax? Like, any hobbies? Um, yeah, I consider myself a student, and while I, I, I love fashion and I enjoy it thoroughly and have a strong point of view there, I feel um, quite insecure when it comes to other arts. My brother is a film curator of the MoMA, and I go to the MoMA constantly, and I take classes there, and I'm a great lover of the arts. I love live music, so I go and listen to live music as much as I can. Um, I take yoga. But I, I do thoroughly enjoy taking classes for things that I enjoy. Uh, question from the audience. Yeah. Do you have a mic up here? I can hear you. I can repeat okay. the question. We can both repeat it. Yeah. Um, I'm also a high school teacher of fashion design. I'm curious, along the way, since getting new friends are back, <clears throat> each other guides for you. And in addition to your advice, does your friend give you Um, that's a great question. She wanted to know what my biggest influences were or who I was influenced by growing up. And because I came from such a small town that didn't necessarily um, reflect on fashion or even really enjoy fashion, I didn't have any influence through elementary school or through fashion. I didn't have anyone that I could talk to about fashion. Um, so I would say my role models came probably from even after college. It was, I think it was just this, this need and this urge to get out of a small town that I was in and how could I motivate myself to do better, but it was also that hunger and that drive again from not having much. Um, I had old movies and that was very inspiring to me. I liked the idea that you could transform yourself simply by what you put on and that's something that is quite universal. Um, and then when I met uh, Mr. Andre Leontali, he inspired me with just the, the simple phrase that um, I was going to meet Anna Wintour, and that's, as you may know, a huge fashion moment. And of course, I was very nervous. I was going to show her my collection, and he said to me, be confident and believe in what you say. And because I am a student and I do like psychology, I'm, I'm constantly learning by observing. And so I figured if that's all that he had to say to me, he didn't have anything, you know, oh, she likes black this season or she likes white. Like, he didn't really have any secrets to tell me. I figured that what that meant was the most important thing you could do for yourself is to believe in yourself and to believe in your story and to stick to it. You don't have to be everything to all people. Um, I design very classic clothes with a twist, and I, I do like for, for women to look uh, classic yet unique. And so if grunge is in, um, grunge is in, and Rachel will be out, and that's okay, because eventually what I design will be back in. And so um, I just tried to take from what he was telling me that I needed to have a very strong point of view, um, because there's so much fashion out there. There really is enough for everybody. Rachel, we're out of time. Um, but I want to thank you for making the effort to come here and share your story uh, and your advice with the students and with the educators and, and with all of our participants in the, uh, in the center and everyone who, who, was, who was here for this conference for the last two days. And um, I'm, of course, not surprised, but um, you're, you're terrific. Thank you. Thank you for including me. I appreciate it.